Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Global Change Fellow Seminar, Stories of Culture and Adaptation. This is the 10th anniversary of the fellowship program. We are excited for you to meet our panelist and Environmental Protection Agency Administrator, Michael Regan, momentarily. I'm Stephanie Kelly, a dual master student in landscape architecture and environmental planning and climate change in society. And I'm Courtney Hotchkiss, a doctoral student in parks, recreation, and tourism management. As you see with me and Stephanie, the Global Change Fellows work in a variety of disciplines and fields, all seeking co-produced solutions to climate change impacts in the communities we serve. Shortly, our special guest, EPA Administrator Michael Regan, will talk about the importance of communities and interdisciplinary scholars working together to address climate change and its disproportionate impact on underserved communities. But first, a quick word about the program from Aransasu Lasserain, Assistant University Director of the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, also known by its acronym CCASC, and host of the Global Change Fellows Program here at NC State University. Stephanie and Courtney are just two of our 11 exemplary fellows this year. Alexandra Nelson, who you see next to me, is another. The program is supported by the U.S. Geological Survey and NC State University. It forms an essential part of the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. We train graduate students to become the climate change professionals we so desperately need. We provide financial, scientific, and professional development support. These graduate students are dedicated to making climate change science better, more ethical, and just. They will make a positive impact on both natural and human communities. When the program began 10 years ago, we knew that finding solutions to climate change would be daunting. Recent EPA reports on impacts to marginalized communities confirm the work is urgent. It is an honor to introduce Michael Regan to the seminar. Administrator Regan's appointment to head the EPA is historic. He is the first African-American male to lead the agency he is no stranger to North Carolina. He is a native son who attended North Carolina A&T University. He also served the people of North Carolina as secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality for Governor Roy Cooper. Administrator Regan, in early September, your agency released a transformative environmental justice study, climate change and social vulnerability in the United States. The report showed that climate change has the worst impact on the communities least prepared to recover. Thank you for prioritizing deep listening to those communities that are most in need. Administrator Regan, it is an honor to have you join us for the 10th anniversary of the Global Change Fellows Program. Welcome. Well, thank you, Aaron Zazu, for that introduction and thank you for your outstanding leadership. You know, as a native North Carolinian born and raised, I am so proud to be here with all of you. And I wanna congratulate you on the 10th anniversary of the Global Change Fellowship Program. And I also want to acknowledge the essential role all of you play in building a healthier and more just future. It's never been more important or more urgent to train the next generation of scientists, engineers, and other scholars in the field of climate advocacy. Just yesterday, President Biden gathered with world leaders in Glasgow and asked the most important question of our time. Will we act or will we condemn future generations to suffer? The answer, of course, is we must act. There is absolutely no other option. That's why under President Biden's leadership, EPA is moving more aggressively than ever before to tackle the climate crisis, but setting the bar high on climate leadership requires that we also set the bar high when it comes to environmental justice, which we know is inextricably linked to racial justice and health justice and economic justice as well. For too long, communities of color and low income communities have disproportionately borne the burden of pollution. They're the same communities who face higher rates of heart and lung disease, whose children are more likely to develop asthma, and who are struggling under the weight of this pandemic. The inequities they face are further compounded by climate change. As Aranzanzu mentioned, EPA just released a report that shows that the most severe harms from climate change fall disproportionately upon underserved communities who are least able to prepare for 
and recover from climate fuel disasters. And at EPA, we are working hard to embed environmental justice into our DNA. That means the voices, the lived experiences, and the stories that belong to our Black, Latinx, and Indigenous and low-income communities will be at the forefront of our decision-making. You all will have a seat at our table. On day one, I told the dedicated staff at EPA that our work in the years ahead will absolutely be guided by the belief that all people in this country have the right to clean air, clean water, and healthier lives, no matter the color of their skin, the money in their pockets, or the communities that they live in. We're gonna live and breathe that mission at EPA. And in doing so, we will ensure that every single child in the United States of America can safely drink from the faucet, inhale, inhale a full breath of clean air, play outdoors, and do it without risk of environmental hazard and harm. If there were ever a moment when we could break the pattern of environmental injustice that has long plagued, plagued this country, I believe that moment is now. But the truth is, we need you. We need all of you, every single one of you. We need your courage, we need your compassion, we need your sense of justice, and we need your ambitious. And that's why interdisciplinary programs like Global Change Fellows are so important to our movement. They show what is possible when people of diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise come together to lift up the stories of marginalized communities and to fight for the change that we all deserve. The stories of frontline and fence line communities and the hard work and dedication of your generation is exactly why we're at this moment where environmental justice is front and center to the White House's agenda and EPA's agenda. So I say to all of you, keep going. Never stop pushing for what is right. And I promise you, I will be with you to fight alongside of you every single step of the way. Thank you all. Administrator Regan, we are so delighted that you were able to join us today. Your leadership is, is just something that we uh, find inspiring. And um, we want to thank you not only for being here and inspiring us as scholars and, and researchers, but also our panelists who are activists in our communities to make them better. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Alexandria Nelson, a first year PhD student in the Sustainable Health Ecology Lab. I'm honored to be a part of the cohort of the Global Change Fellowship marks its 10 year anniversary. I know the research that my colleagues and I conduct is more important now than ever. EPA Administrator Regan is honoring and respecting community voices, paying attention to and elevating the stories of distinct communities assists in our work to recognize and respond to the impacts of climate change and environmental inequities. We are delighted to introduce a very distinct culture in our nation, the Gullah Geechee community. We will now have a special greeting from Queen Quet, Chiefess and Head of State of the Gullah Geechee Nation. Good morning, Queen Quet. We are honored to have you on our panel. Peace, glad for day with all of honor chillin. As I been in this stone so long. I been in this just on so long, crying, Lord, Lord, give we more time for pride. I been in this just on so long. Oh, this year, honey, hear it Oh, this year, honey, hear it Crying, Lord, Lord, give we more time for pride. I've been in this year stone so long. So glad for there with all the hundred children. Then come from 
Glasgow and thing over there on the Scotland. They come here now, back home, the Carolinas. Oh, and Brother Regan, bring we all back. This is your Carolina story. But plenty of hundred children with the healing. They get the people to crack your teeth so, cause something to do this year. Plenty of we will be there from the sea island from Jacksonville, North Carolina, down to Jacksonville, Florida. When you get it, we the crack we teach so, and we the grind in England and thing like that. Eddie. Then for do this your thing or bring some the environmental harm the we community and thing like that. Rest the thing the way we crack we teeth and thing like that. Then cause we do this year, we want to crack your teeth about the day, adapt, and that adaptation process many times led to assimilation, led to the dictation to communities of culture on our coast here in the Carolinas in Georgia and Florida to say to them something about your culture isn't the way to do it. Whether that is wrong down like addition, whether that's speaking our native tongue, whether that is our natural building pattern of family compounds that are balanced with the natural environment that ensure that your homes are not built into the sea. They're not built into the marsh. They're not built into the ocean that actually you recognize and respect that the water is sacred. That space of the middle passage that our ancestors came through bringing our language, bringing these agrarian traditions, bringing our cultural heritage that is Gullah Geechee was not something that should be erased. There was nothing we needed to really adapt to. We didn't need to be reassembled because God made us who we are. Brother Regan mentioned frontline communities and that terminology often is referred to in war for those that they sacrifice first. He mentioned fence line communities that hearken to gated areas where the type of overbuilding and what I call destruction meant has happened time and time again and also displaced the indigenous her heritage here, Kusabo, Yemisi, Adisto, Cree, and Gullah Geechee from the coastline. And we had to move inland, adapting to speak in ways that could bridge the gap between us and others, but never wanting to lose all of who we be and thing like that. Because every cultural community has value, but you would only know that value, like they call us black gold, if you paid attention. If you, even if you needed extra sets of eyes, you looked more closely and saw that God made us all in unique ways. And those unique ways of this coastline from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida, and 30 to 35 miles inland to the St. Johns River is a cultural heritage landscape that is Gullah Geechee where we continue to harvest from the land and from the sea. And we don't want people mining out our sand nor mining out our souls and taking our stories, extracting them, assimilating them and reselling them, commodifying them the way our ancestors, the Igbo, Mandinka, Malinke, Yoruba, Gola, Gizi, Mendi, Temni, Fiki, Bibio, and the Yamasi, Kusabo, Edisto were commodified. Our culture has adapted to being able to stay isolated, even as these other types of bridges came to our sea islands, bringing in other cultures, bringing in other dynamics, including zoning laws, including highway projects, including highway widening projects, including urbanization, suburbanization, and plantation plantations from the 15, the 16, the 17, the 1800s, and then into the 1900s, when people felt they wanted to go back to a time that they valued. But that was when they put price tags on who we are. When our ancestors were literally sold on auction blocks, and now people come and want us to sell to them the family, because the land that we we did the land, the land that we family, the waterway that we bloodline. So we say from the Gullah Geechee Nation, we're not storytellers. I'm not a storyteller. I'll say for myself, I am not a storyteller. I'm a historian and I'm the artivist. 
I do my activism through the arts. Storytelling is lying. And we've had a lot of storytelling about who we be down young, and especially about what this coast holds and many don't value it. They don't see the shine on the black gold, but they saw the goldenness of the Carolina gold rice. They don't see the healing and the power and the energy that's within our souls, but they saw indigo souls that many died with their hands blue after they picked the sea island cotton too. So I'm happy to be here today after presenting at the United Nations COP event on justice and equity to say to them when we hear equity and justice and it's abbreviated ej that in the us they would be talking about environmental justice and in any case to many of us who are indigenous people black people people now that call us this term bipoc communities but coastline communities not frontline communities that you can sacrifice, not fence line communities because you want to gate us out of these types of arenas to share with one another, but the shoreline communities that call out to you from our culture that we need to come together in the circle on the coastline, whether we be shouting or whether we're sitting, meditating, and taking this word that they're using an adaptation and resiliency called retreat and using it the way we prefer, which is Wusa. So we can breathe out the toxicity, destroying the land and together in the circle, we can take a stand. So I'm so pleased to be here with what I call global change folks today. And so that we can crack we teeth a little bit more about our journey on this day. So thank you, thank you to all of Hunter Chillin what bring me up today for joining you in this circle of our stories of culture and adaptation. We love being global change folk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, well, wonderful. Wow, thank you so much, Queen Quet, for that powerful greeting. We know you will have to leave the discussion a bit early towards the end, but again, we want to thank you for joining us now in the panel discussion. Hello everyone, I'm Lauren Farr, a Global Change Fellow, and my doctoral work is in avian ecology. And this is Global Change Fellow Melody Hunter-Pillion, a PhD student in public history. We will both be your moderators for today's discussion. Our panelists today are a remarkable group of people who help us understand how climate change impacts distinctive cultures and the work that is being done to galvanize communities. And we'll ask them to turn on their cameras and microphones now. Mm. You have all now met Queen Quet. As Chief Des of the Gullah Geechee Nation, we appreciate her special greeting that she has brought to our seminar this morning. Also on our panel is Kayla Braithwaite a 20-year-old Special Projects Operations Associate at March On and former Director of Operations at Zero Hour. She lives in North Carolina, but was raised in St. Croix, United States Virgin Islands. She is an avid youth organizer in the climate justice movement, and her efforts have appeared in Teen Vogue and throughout the movement alongside other amazing justice organizers. Also joining us are Jordan Revels, Coral Avery, and Beth Roach. Jordan is a member of the Lumbee tribe, former grassroots organizing fellow at Friends of the Earth and community organizer for NC Warren. Jordan has witnessed the impact of climate change on communities in rural Robinson and Scotland counties. A prestigious Udall scholar while studying at UNC Pembroke and former student government vice president, Jordan looks for creative solutions for a sustainable environment. Coral Avery is a natural resource specialist for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Climate Resilience Program and Tribal Youth and Climate Liaison for our sister organization. That's the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. She is a citizen of the Shawnee tribe. Beth Roach is a citizen of the Nottoway tribe and co-founder of the Alliance of the Native Seed Keepers and a storyteller, although, I am now reevaluating re that term after Queen Quet, uh, after her statements about that. Certainly something to think about, maybe a story keeper for her yeah. tribe. 
She yes. also serves as the Tribal Resilience Coordinator for the North Carolina Commission on Indian Affairs and was recently elected to Vice Chair of the Tribal Council. So we wanna thank all of you for being here and for our audience members, as you listen to this conversation, which we think is gonna be very engaging, we want you and invite you to please put your questions for the panelists into the Q&A function of the, of the webinar. So we're gonna start out though um, with something for our panelists, our first question for you guys, something that Administrator Regan has um, alluded to before. He's made a statement that, that we have to meet communities where we are in order to think about resiliency and adaptation um, for climate change. And by meeting communities where we are, I'm just wondering, and we'll start with you, Kayla and Jordan, but we're gonna have all of the panelists chime in on this, the importance of hearing all voices, of hearing all the, the stories or lived experiences. What does the power of story or lived experience, um, what does the power of story do to, to help us to understand and respond to climate change? Jordan and Kayla, start with you. Yeah, so I feel like the narrative that is held from frontline stories, folks who are suffering the first and worst from the impacts of environmental injustice as well as climate injustice are incredibly important. I think especially with the narrative around what climate change really looks like. If you look 10 years ago, one thing I always say is that when you heard about climate change, the only thing you really saw was polar bears and the ice caps. And while polar bears are absolutely important, and conservation of animals as well as the Arctic caps are super important for helping curb climate change and all the compounding issues that come with that. It's not as if polar bears were the only ones suffering from environmental injustice issues or climate issues, right? But a lot of the narrative has been centered on uh, interest of older white folks and not really centered in the lived experiences and stories of BIPOC people, indigenous peoples, people who are suffering worse than first uh, from this, people from other countries who are feeling the effects very much so more exacerbated. We're seeing this in a more violent and uh, severe way now, but it's not as if it hasn't been happening for years, uh, right? So really centering those stories of folks who are suffering from this and are doing the work to conserve their environment to be able to protect themselves, their future generations, their culture, traditions, and heritage. That is incredibly important for shifting the narrative within the movement so we can actually see the severity of it. We know how bad this is and what it's really gonna take for us to take action as well as stop these issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jordan. Kayla? Thanks, Jordan. Um, yeah, storytelling and lived experiences and especially learning more about how other like Black Caribbean folks like me and um, other youth have been moving throughout organizing and moving like in their own communities and how they've been facing, you know, like very like near apocalyptic effects of the climate crisis, like learning that is what actually like allowed me to feel called to to do movement work. Um, I moved to the States when I was about 12 or so and had also like been learning about the climate crisis because I lived on an island and we had been experiencing worsening hurricanes already. Um, but when I moved to the States, I like it was like a very whitewashed movement and I was 12 and already like kind of aware of that. Um, and one year I had like went to this conference where I met another black organizer in Zero Hour, which is a really like lovely like um women of color led youth led climate justice organization that really hit on like the intersections of the climate crisis and allowed me to feel like i had like a like political home like it was my first when i was like really young um we were a group of like ragtag kids who like weren't scholars at all we were just like i think the oldest of us were probably like 20 at the time um and so just us being able to sit and process how all of us from different places had similar like anxieties around a climate crisis. We had seen like how our families and like our parents had been dealing with this without like an academic view um, and without the view of like how like old rich white folks have been experiencing the climate crisis from a very distant like miles away kind of approach. Um, being able to 
feel closer to those folks, being able to feel closer to the stories around climate justice and learning about the origin of the environmental justice movement and its intersections throughout different kind of like worlds of, of movement work has been really like pivotal for me, has allowed me to stay in and learn more from like ancestors who have already kind of like laid clear like what it takes to have a liber liberatory like world and a world where like black and indigenous women can feel safe, both environmentally, personally, um, and in other kind of like avenues of how we move around like our spaces. Um, so I'd say that like the value of lived experience and story keeping and storytelling has been incredibly important to build like my comrades in this fight um, and to build like the trust needed to know that like we're all like in this together, um, just like doing what we can with the tools we have. Um, and that's like what we're just gonna have to do with that. Thank you, Kayla. And Beth and Coral, carrying on this, when we talk about this oral, this strong oral tradition that we have in, you know, Jordan's already talked about um, thinking from um, Native peoples, and then Kayla, and also Queen Quet representing that African diaspora. And so continue to talk about this importance and this power of story, especially as we see landscapes being eroded and how place is really connected to story. So Beth, Coral, if you'll chime in. Sure, uh, Nawe. Yeah, I think that you've led me into this perfect background picture that I have. If y'all can just take a look the wrong way. Um, so this is a cypress tree hanging out in the middle of the Albemarle Sound, just a few miles away from where I am in Eastern North Carolina in Bertie County. I took this picture on a kayak and to the right of me in the picture is the uh, Bertie County shoreline where there is a stand of cypress trees and you can between the shoreline and this tree is where land has been for thousands, for hundreds and thousands of years. On that land are so many of our archaeological sites, our village sites, and you have evidence of where we were living on the outer banks of Carolina, Eastern Shore, Virginia, all the way down the coast and really all around Turtle Island. Uh, we've been living on these, on these shorelines for hundreds and thousands of years. Well, with our shorelines being impacted by erosion, sea level, uh, rise, we are losing the sites that help tell our stories. And so there is this loss of, of, of knowing that you know, our ancestors' remains and, and the evidence of where we are are, are being uh, dissipated in front of our eyes. And that's deeply sad in the sense of not being able to hold on to that history and learn from it and pass it on. And it has real life present implications when we are attaching our people to the land in terms of uh, new projects and new infrastructure and any type of new development. If there's not that strong connection, like this is our people and here's where we are, uh, then you're not gonna know who now. to talk to, and who to, and, and who to engage with. And so it's sad on, on, this, on the level of not knowing our, our, our past. And it's also tragic because it deeply impacts our ability to, uh, to have influence on, on the world as we go forward. Thank you, Coral. Arise Wapani. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for having me here. Um, yeah, I really value everything that everyone's had to say already. And um, I'll kind of reiterate and add that these stories are passed down from generation to generation to tell our, our history, our culture, our ecological knowledge. And indigenous people have been here since time immemorial. So these stories also tell us stories of historic climate adaptation and resilience in the face of change um, over all these years. Uh, I'll also add the there's an extreme importance for other agencies to work uh, who are working towards climate action to partner with tribes and indigenous people um, and other BIPOC from all areas because we have that historic and intergenerational knowledge and apply it uh, to current and future circumstances. So even when those stories are not appropriate to share outside of our communities, decision making and our worldviews and values are always guided by these stories uh, from our ancestors and, and from our future ancestors as well. Thank you. Queen Quet, I saw you nodding your head vigorously when Coral said, you know, these intergenerational stories, these, you know, these stories have to be passed down It's an active thing. Yes, but I also heard her talk about these stories that are not to be shared outside the circle 
of your community. Mm -hmm. And that's the critical balance that we are having here in the Gullah Geechee Nation. I want to give a clear example because we have the director, Regan, who is here today from the EPA, because the Gullah Geechee Nation is directly working with the EPA on a project that I designed and submitted to their building blocks group. And so we are actually working on the St. Helena Island Gullah Geechee living landscape. And so, of course, when they came in, they came in marching in like government people do. They march in. They march in with a checklist. They march in with a workbook. But we don't work from your book. We work from our circle. We work from our culture. We are the living book. And so we had to then take them out of a very linear behavior into a circular behavior where everybody's knowledge is valued and it's a shared experience, but where you don't trample on my humanity. You don't come in like you are a device to mine out anything. You sit and when I present something to you, then you can either take it or as they would say, or leave it. But don't try to extract from me that which is not for you. There are certain things that I will speak to the elders about. They'll share it with me. And I know how to interpret what part to give out to the public and what part to keep within the circle. And that is critical so that intergenerational learning happens in all the work that we do with the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition and through our Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank. We try to truly teach community participatory collaboration, not just research, which can tend to be extractive and be exploitive, but actually come in at any level, if it's government, if it's academia, which is almost like another form of government. I know many of y'all know what I'm saying. Um, and so not come into the community marching in to get and take out, but sit with the community and learn what we can co-create that now can be utilized in ways that it's in a language you can overstand. We've been under too long, so I like over, overstand. And then we can also take it back and articulate it then in our language and our traditional ways with our community members as well. But we don't have to tell you all of what we're talking about in the house. You see what I'm saying? So we, we were raised with manners. So everything that's going on in the house and for everybody or doors and things like that. So you don't take everything out the house. And if you give away everything, what do you have left? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Such such a great point, and and I love what you brought up. You know about you know learning from and you know engaging in these communities because you wanna you wanna sort of build that understanding and you want to you know build that trust with those communities before, like you said, you go in and you and you take take take. Let's take a minute, you know, and 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 learn, <laughs> you know, yes, from yes. yeah from, from all community. of these. That's, and that's how you build relationships. There you go. And so now we really, I like to end up with a family instead of a team, okay? Because the team, there might be a bunch of egos still trying to just win for themselves and get the, you know, the MVP ring. But when you have the family, you know that if the entire family is healthy, all of us are healthy. This year for all of we aim for me, you know? And so that's the thing. So now this EPA team, I done told them, I said, so we doing a federal occupation, huh? Cause they're like, yeah, cause you ain't getting rid of us now, no time soon. We like this model. Um, so it has worked very well uh, working with the landscape architects and the community and they've learned from us and we've learned from them. And now we're going forward together. This circle is unbroken. Mm -hmm. There you go, there you go. So. I kind of want to switch gears here for a moment and sort of talk about this topic of climate change and educating our youth, which we all know is, you know, extremely huge because you want to be able to pass down what you're learning about climate change to these, you know, young activists like, you know, so much of you are yourself um, and you're doing such amazing work. So I want to throw this question sort of at Coral and then I'll move to Beth and Jordan and then everyone else can chime in because I would love to know sort of what what is going on in your community as far as like, you know, educating your youth about climate change. So Coral, we'll start with you and then we'll work our way around. Can you repeat that question one more time for me, please? Yeah, of course. So like how, how are, how are um, like, are there like any obstacles, I guess I should say, when it comes to um, 
educating your like youth about climate change or what is your 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 community doing as far as educating your youth about climate change definitely thank you of course um it's kind of tricky on where to start with that <laughs> <laughs> um so i don't i don't live or work directly in my uh tribal nation in my community um I'll start by saying that um, Shawnee people live across a wide diaspora as many other Native people. Um, Shawnee are originally from the Ohio River Valley area and our tribal nation uh, resides in the most northeast corner of Oklahoma today. And as you mentioned in my introduction, I'm located on the West Coast. Um, about 5% of tribal citizens today live in the state of California. I myself live in uh, Kalapuya lands of the Willamette Valley, Oregon but I'm from uh, Kumi Islands of Southern California, San Diego area. So all of my work today um, is based in the Pacific Northwest and that's the majority of the uh, tribal communities and youth especially that I'm working with. But I'll also add that members of my tribal nation have been displaced and have ended up where they are today due to centuries of physical and cultural genocide um, as I'm sure many today, if not all um, who are speaking can relate to. Um, and for my community, this includes uh, the Trail of Tears, Indian boarding schools, um, even military service and many other factors. So across this diaspora, tribal citizens are facing many different types of climate impacts and injustices. And those are all informing the different ways that we share our stories and that we lead in um, our values and priorities for education of current and future generations as well. Um, so yeah, obviously those factors are all causing a lot of additional obstacles too. Um, there's a lot of focus on, on mental health as well as uh, you know, physical health and safety due to climate impacts. Um, there's all, all these other external forces that are facing all of us at every moment um, that are important to recognize and carry with us in, in climate work as well. And I'll end it there just so I'm not talking too much, but I'm really excited to uh, hear what others have to say about this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I love how you brought up, you know, about mental health, which that's something that a lot of us can forget about. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Beth and Jordan. Yeah, let's, let's go now to, um, let's hear from Jordan and then we'll move to Beth. Okay, yeah. So when it comes to engaging youth, I feel like it's it's a tough one. Um, not just in my community, but I feel a lot of communities, though I feel a lot of youth can relate to the anxieties and pains, the existential threat of climate change. Um, a lot of folks here coming from communities like ours are very rural, very low income, low resource, low wealth. There are a lot of other immediate issues that are always at the forefront uh, occupying our time and attention, uh, whether it's uh, missing, murdered, indigenous uh, peoples, two-spirit kin, or uh, the issues of substance abuse, domestic violence. Uh, there's a lot of compounding issues that make it really hard to focus on this. And so part of the challenge is really, how can we expand the scope to also include our work of environmental justice with these other issues? How can we tackle these immediate issues and support youth um, while also focusing on the long-term big picture? How do we get them engaged with that? And so it takes a lot of different forms, um, some in particular being more focused uh, cohort work where we actually teach folks, you know, this, these environmental injustices are directly linked with the issues that the greater community is facing, right? And here's what you can do to build up your capacity, to build up your skill sets, not just for yourself, but also for you to go take to your other community members, to your family members, to your church members, people who are within the community. So you can also be teaching them the same thing to develop that resiliency, uh, to develop that capacity to really do something about these issues, and not become complacent with it, right? Because it's unrealistic to expect a lot of youth, especially from our kinds of communities to just be able to fix environmental injustice because there's so much that needs to be tackled, right? And so it takes a very comprehensive scope and approach for engaging youth, I feel, in a way that's 
non extractive and also ultimately going to be most beneficial for them. All right. Let's hear from Beth now. Thank you, Jordan, for that. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that we've seen is and I think we're all experiencing this, is this climate grief, is, is the overwhelming sense of what are we going to do? And like what Jordan said, we can't solve it all. And um, how do we start to break that down? And similar to Coral, and I know all of us here, our community was displaced and has gone to urban centers and are deeply concerned and want to be home and want to be engaged with the, the landscapes, but often are working multiple jobs and are doing whatever they can to survive. And so in the Nottaway, community and then uh, some of the other work that I do, we are um, welcoming people home with paddles, getting people on the water and just to connect on the water so that we can one, uh, just be in community together and, and sing to our ancestors and pray and, and you know just feel what it feels like to be there and to listen to what the ancestors want us to do. I'm in fact hardly um, taking Zoom calls anymore and saying, if you want to meet with me, then we're going to meet by the water. Because I feel as though that environment informs us on what we need to do going forward. These Zoom platforms are amazing in a lot of ways, but there's such a lack of information that we're not getting when we're not in that place with each other. So, so much of it is welcoming pe people home and reconnecting us and then truly letting the ancestral spirits uh, help guide us in these conversations. And, and that's really where uh, the traction is, 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 and that's where the magic is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love that. I love that. Um, Kayla, we'll move to you. What, what, what sparked you to get involved with youth and climate change? Um, yeah, I've been doing this work ever since I was like in high school. Um, I met other like young folks who were doing this work and like kind of just like brought me in with open arms. Um, so I think it was easy in that aspect, like just like happening upon a group of folks that were really aligned with me and that I could grow with in this movement. And who were also who also looks like me, like a lot of them were like black, like other immigrant folks, um, folks who like had parents who were like working class um, and who had like lived experiences and had been um, had more like firsthand accounts of how the climate crisis um, disproportionately affects them. Um, and we kind of like had the duty of processing like what it looked like in this sphere, like in context of um, like police brutality that a lot of like black women face, like the sexual violence that we face, um, having to deal with like going to school and figuring out like post high school things um, and the burnout that you get, like if you're just like a kid figuring out how to save the world. Cause I know like when I was younger, it seemed like huger, like much bigger than I, than I was. And it still does feel that way like all the time. Um, and also like while doing this work, also having to like process, like living in a very like white space. I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and so I like I'm doing climate justice work and also is like hate crimes like twice in one week, like last week. So having to like deal with all of that and also like doing this work as like a 20 year old is like really um, difficult. Um, but I found that the most like educating moments for me has literally just been meeting up with friends and building those relationships where I feel that I have folks I can trust in this work and folks that are really smart in many different ways, um, ways that like I can't like meet with, but I like really admire. Um, and so those moments where I've been able to like build like joy and trust within this like work and within like myself has been really just like moving. Um, it's helped me become much more like experimental with how I can like take care of like my community. Um, I stayed at a farm for a bit last year and I had like a lot of space to just learn to learn about like how my folks have been tending lands like since we um, were like moved to this side of the world. Um, and so having those spaces like to build even more community and learn about how I like absolutely love 
just like taking care of land and like learning more about um like the critters around me and learning more about how like I am just like inherently like in like our ecosystem and not like someone cutting in has been really enlivening um and bringing other folks like me into this movement in those ways has been just like the the path of like not like least resistance but it's been much more like helpful for them and me to do that kind of work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gosh i loved hearing your perspective so thank you thank you kayla um quink what we'll move to you because i know yourself as well as you know the Gullah Geechee community really focus one thing that you really focus on is educating your youth so I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic well, it goes right back to the last question right full circle as say 360 to intergenerational mm -hmm. learning everything in the cosmology of Gullah Geechee's has to do with every generation those we can see now those who are behind us and those who are in front of us so it is the Sankofa bird literally flying so that bird appears to have its neck looking back while it flies forward with an egg in its hand which can feed the next generation in many ways and so here our elders teach us if honen and know where honen to did from honen gwai know where honen to gwai. The only way you will know the past, Sankofa, you will have to go back to those elders, but you also have to go to ancestral stories. Those ancestral stories don't speak from the grave other than through the lived experience and the DNA of those who exist now. So I am always that person that as much as I am a computer scientist and a mathematician and I can do all the theoretical stuff, I'm a writer, I'm a historian, I can do all that linear stuff in the Western world. I know how to separate those two worlds. I know how to do that when it's necessary because that is what those people can so-called respect or grasp some understanding from. But I also know how to bring people into my world and not bring them to trample on sacred spaces, but at the same time have sacred experiences. So I just finished doing that with one of one of the sets of schools that come to me annually. And we hadn't been hosting anybody because of the ongoing pandemic. But this group we chose to host because I know how hardworking they are and they already are at a school that they literally live in the environment they have to cut wood to heat the school with they have to cook their food they have to farm their food so it wasn't a disconnect for them to come and work with us here on an adaptation project but for others who come from urban environments never been on an island in their life that kind of thing of various cultures then we bring them in through songs and through energy and power and showing them historic sites and then having an opportunity to stay in our Gullah Geechee garden and then as some would say process dialogue share from that experience now for the academics amongst us i've seen a couple of questions in our q a that ties to this like what do you do so that you can allow for the youth to deal with all these as we would call them multi-stressors at the same time well it's not just the youth <laughs> we'll expand that to anybody dealing with all the multi-stressors one of the things that some people are against and i'm not and maybe that's because i grew up during the period of segregation i was one of the first people into integration and i've never been against segregation because i live on a sea island that's 90 to 95 percent black is Gullah Geechee. So that's not been a world that I never saw. More and more too many youth that are black youth, that are indigenous youth, that are Latinx youth, they've never been allowed to be in a space that's just them, except in their households, okay? So I'm finding that a lot of them are very pleased to be in some of these groups, unfortunately by Zoom, that are actually just BIPOC groups because now they have support for what they're saying they don't have to debate what they're saying if they have an emotion or a feeling about something someone can reinforce it and someone can help them heal they can give them actual tools and examples of what to do to heal because they've had that same lived experience so just like i explained to people if there's a woman's retreat the women would be very upset if a man invaded that space and we can switch it around if there's a men's retreat the man would be very upset if the women invaded that space. So you shouldn't be upset if we say there's a BIPOC retreat 
or it's just an all black retreat or it's just an all indigenous retreat don't invade that space that is colonization all over again so for those who really operate from that and who we have to get them to shift their paradigm of overstanding shift their paradigm of community engagement you use the word but it's not engagement <laughs> okay you use these words and you say you know participatory research you can't come and demand we answer your question that is not participatory research that is again colonization and exploitation so the Gullah Geechee sustainability think tank did this book we be Gullah Geechee cultural capital and collaboration anthology in it we actually have research principles and guidelines so that people respect the Gullah Geechee nation and don't just come in trying to extract something so you get your ph and your d at the end and your dr in the front okay and so we thought this was just from us to the world that constantly comes here on how we live who we truly are and not how other people who never spoke to us and only went in archives or only went online and googled us um, wrote about us we thought this was only for us come to find out this is one of the best-selling Gullah Geechee books out there next to Lorenzo Dow Turner's Africanisms in the Gullah Language and Legacy of Evo Landing that I also did as an anthology because other cultural communities have simply taken out the words Gullah Geechee and put their name there to say that it's the same thing that they want to tell people about coming in to say you're researching us, coming in to say you're training us, coming in to say you're, but you're coming in with us when you're really not doing that, you're extracting from us. Engagement and extraction start with E, but they're not the same. And so they feel different and they can be lived differently. And so it's the lived experience with our youth that help them to realize what their grandparents do is something good to do. Not that the other society tells you get rid of it and then you do that. And I've also been educating the youth a lot, of course, for 40 years now I've been doing this work, but I'm a computer scientist. So I was the first one to put a website online in world history that had Gullah Geechee in the name. So now I'm on Facebook, Gullah Geechee Nation. I'm on Twitter at Gullah Geechee. I'm on Instagram at Gullah Geechee. I'm on Clubhouse as Queen Quet. I'm on TikTok now, Gullah Geechee Nation. Why? Because the youth of the Gullah Geechee Nation said, Queen, where you at on TikTok? Where are you at on Clubhouse? They turn on your crack and they ain't know what the stuff is. We need you to come on your, because they're chilling, they know what we are, what, what we culture. So I'm on all these platforms, <laughs> educating the youth, that way even while we socially distance but i still get them out here in the field on the land on the shore at the water in the marsh and a lot of them have said because they watch a video or they look at my facebook page every day they tell me oh go to get your day so i watch go to get your tv too on youtube they say they use that and then they're inspired to come home or come back home if they're away come to the shore. So you never know how that one minute or that three minutes could change somebody's life. And so definitely just take that time and just breathe, Wusa again, retreat. Yeah. With the, yeah. yes. Queen Quet, yes, using technology to meet people where they are, <laughs> just like uh, EPA Administrator Regan said, and Queen Quet, we know that you have to go. I know you have a new commitment. So we just wanna thank you for being here. And now I'm gonna ask the rest uh, of our panelists because we do have some questions from our audience. Again, audience members, if you have some questions, please put those into the Q&A section uh, of this webinar. But Brittany has a question for all of you. Um, how did you get your community members engaged in any restoration projects that you might have been involved in or led? Are there any collaborations with associations, organizations outside the Carolinas? Jordan, I'm gonna start with you because I know you have a tremendous uh, respect for and uh, involvement with the Lumber River. The Lumber River, very much a part of the Lumbee culture, uh, that, that swamp ecosystem, a part of the system of strategy that your ancestors used to resist violence against them. Yeah, so in terms of uh, strategies and ways that cooperation has been used to do a lot of restoration work to, and also preservation work, I would say. Uh, one of the most recent examples is uh, we have a community garden agroforestry project that we've been spearheading, uh, both myself and another Lumbee youth with our cultural elders. And really what this is, um, 
one of the food elders, uh, he's a black ecologist from NC State, uh, seems Justin Robinson. He puts it really nicely. When you're looking at the impacts of racism, it's not just about the things that you do see and feel, but the things you no longer see, right? The food waste, the traditions, the things that were deemed less than uh, by settler colonialism. And as a result, I mean, you know, white folks back in the day had decided, no, that's for black and brown people. We don't eat that. We want to prioritize, prioritize that. A lot of these foodway traditions, amazing foods, healthy foods, uh, herbals, uh, herbal plants, uh, medicinal things, a lot of it's lost, right? And a lot of those practices haven't been uh, done in so long. And so part of collaboration with other folks across the state has been to bring that back home, right? And to restore a lot of those traditions in a way that is not just going to be able to restore that, in a sense, to the people who had some familiarity with that a lot of years ago, but had an intergenerational exchange going on to where this is something that's going to pull folks in to get them to see this is the importance of why we're doing this work and why we need to be curbing the impacts of climate change. Because if we don't, we're not going to be able to, to have these traditions. We're not going to be have all these medicines that our ancestors used and practice with for so many generations. And so part of that work is the progress of, of ancestor work really so that not just my generation but future generations down the line will be able to pass this down uh, and this will be something that's kept and preserved rather than lost to the ages excellent coral kayla beth any of you guys come on in you so know. any color yeah go ahead sorry I have a example from Nottaway community. We started doing river cleanups over 10 years ago at a site that is significant to our ancestors and today. And at the first time we did the cleanup, we picked up over, I think it was like 30 tires. It was like, there's a boat ramp. It's around the river, a whole bathroom set. Like I'm talking sink, shower, commode, the whole thing. They just pitched it in the ravine. And, you know, year after year, we've gone back, but that first year was like a full on, like two trailers worth of trash. Well, several years later, we started to find really old trash again. So we found like glass soda bottles from the nineties. We saw, we saw beer cans that from the seventies and eighties. And we we're like, what's going on? Like, how come we're finding this old trash? Cause we've already been cleaning the banks for a few years now. So what's going on? Well, around that same time, um, the local wood pellet plant, had expanded their permit and they were now allowed to log more acres. And what they were doing was logging old swamps and those swamps were releasing all this old trash. So we observed the old trash and then we made the connection that they were doing more logging. And so now we're looking at logging and, and, and considering like, well, what is the impact of logging that's happening in our community? And then what policies are there that are monitoring this? And then where are we in the equation? So where can we, step in and voice our concerns. But we really didn't have that full on uh, understanding of the problem and, uh, until we were just on the ground doing this work together. And now we are in full conversation. We have great relationship with members of the EPA. Um, and the Nottaway have a special <laughs> condition where we have uh, a watershed that straddles two states, two EPA regions, three and four. Um, there are six native communities within the watersheds. Uh, there's one federal, several state, several non-recognized. And so when we're all trying to work together, we have these different interests or these different competing obstacles as far as recognition statuses and, and government bureaucracies. Um, but what's happening in the watershed is happening to all of us. And so, you know, it's this on the ground observations, becoming really curious, figuring out what the other problems are, how are you going to have part, you know, what partnerships can involve, um, some of it's through, you know, EPA and, and some localities and North Carolina Commission on Indian Affairs and DEQ and Albemarle Pamela National Estuary Partnership. These are all partners that have come into the sphere and also um, other NGOs that are able to help, like the Nature Conservancy knows that there are a lot of areas that are being logged like long leaf pine that are hardly um, in existence as far as big stands of trees go. We also have cypress swamps that are not only being logged, um, but they're also um, turning into ghost forests because of saltwater intrusion. So we have these all common interests, um, yet you know, we're coming from a cultural standpoint. These folks are coming from a biological diversity standpoint. We all have these issues, but really it wasn't until we were working together to, to be on the ground 
from? Did we start to ask these questions? And now that we have you know, all this knowledge, we have many more questions and problems to contend with, but at least we are gaining some language and awareness around where we need to start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Beth, going going off of that, just a follow up question for you. I was wondering if you could tell us more about why harvesting seeds is important and what that means for indigenous communities as well as non tribal citizens. Oh, okay, yeah. So I, we we think of seed keeping like time travel. So just imagine holding seeds that your ancestors spent thousands of years cultivating. And so it takes you way beyond 400 years ago, right? I mean, these seeds were carefully selected and cared for and loved for, for the next generation for thousands of years. And so when we think about seed keeping now, you know, these seeds are holding our stories of um, survival. They also are showing us our migration patterns and helping to, to, to back up a lot of our old histories. Like, you know, we're here in Eastern North Carolina, now mid-Atlantic region, but our stories say that we started in Central America, the Yucatan Peninsula. And when you look at the corn that is specific to our communities, you can trace the variations of the corn along this path down to the Yucatan Peninsula and such. And there's many, many other examples of that. So one, seed keeping is your story keeping. It's, it's your history. It's, it's really you know, reinforcing who we are as a people and how we survived. It's the proof of your ancestors' love. I mean, I mean, just imagine you've got your dug up plot and you're ready to plant these seeds. I mean, it took, you know, year after year planting these seeds to get to this point. And now we have a, a threat to our biological diversity, right? Like not only have we lost a lot of our communal agricultural practices when we lost land and when we've been dis displaced, uh, but we've also lost the ability to grow out a lot of these different varieties. And, you know, thinking of corn in particular, you need a really wide area of corn uh, buffer so that it doesn't cross pollinate to keep these things uh, safe for the future going forward. So, you know, as I know that y'all are aware of monocropping and GMOs and things like that. So that, you know, is, is a huge threat to just these individual efforts of our communities over time. And also, you know, we can't just put seeds on a shelf in a lockbox and, and hope that they stay put. They're not like a book. You can't put them on the shelf. You have to grow your seeds every year to keep them viable, to keep them healthy. And also our seeds are the original climate adaptators. Are, you know, they, they've been adapting to climate from time immemorial. So we also have to grow our seeds every year so that they are able to update their DNA and their, their own DNA so they can help um, with this changing climate. And so you know, we love to work with seeds and tribal communities. It's really, it's a, it's a one-stop shop for your uh, ancestral traditions, for honoring your ancestors. Uh, past and present going forward. It's a wonderful place to hold language classes. And we have so our agricultural ceremony, uh, our agricultural calendar is our ceremonial calendar. So it's also deeply rooted in our spirituality and our, and just, you know, who we are as a people. Uh, so truly seed keeping is everything. And if you are any type of gardener, then you are going to be well aware of your climate, whether it's too hot or not enough water or uh, is your soil healthy. So, you know, really by just growing tomatoes on your balcony, you're going to be able to learn a lot about what's going on. And um, it could just be as simple as that. Excellent, thank you. I think it's fascinating, Seed Keepers, um, the, the program that you're doing and, um, and the other comments that you had to make. Uh, Kayla and Coral, I don't know that we've had a chance to hear from you about any collaborations you might have been doing yet or projects that you're working on as far as restoration that you wanna share with us. I just moved to um, Western North Carolina about a month and a half ago. So none here other than like volunteering at community gardens a couple minutes away from my home. Um, so I don't think I have anything super valuable to add here in the like couple of minutes we have left. I know we still got a question for you though. And then Coral, what about you? Um, I would probably reiterate, I've, I've done plenty of restoration work, but I don't think there's any one story that would really, um, you know, hit home and, and be great in this moment. So I'd love to um, move on to another question. Yeah, so let me um, just ask you all about the future, looking ahead. And there's something Queen Quet had said too, when we were talking about this stance that maybe uh, resource officials, um, academics and other folks might take who might mean well, who might mean well, uh, coming in with a colonizer stance though in the way they approach it. When you look at the future, 
and how organizations might work with you. What do you want for the future and how would you like to best work with or how might people best work with you, including offices like the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, USGS, other uh, you know, organizations like that. Let's start with Jordan, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, it's, it's tough uh, to handle that question um, because it happens quite a bit because uh, people are very well-intentioned, well-meaning, um, but it's always important that not just myself and other panelists, uh, but other youth who are engaging with this work in the movement are able to stand firm. And I would say, call this out for the colonialism that it is and say, you know, you know, I don't think this is something that is very respective of this interaction. This should not be a transactional thing. This should not be extractive because oftentimes you will find that is the case. Um, I know personally this has happened uh, a lot of times with larger nonprofits uh, that are global, national, um, or academics coming at it from more of a, how can I get research or how can I be a part of studying your community up under a microscope really. Um, and so it, it, it's important that it's not transactional. Um, it, that's not how relations operate when it comes to our communities. Uh, there has to be a give and take of both and. And so it's important that for anybody who is looking at assisting, uh, helping or doing any sort of intentional work that you're actually committing to community first and not your own intentions, your own motives and agendas, right? Um, so really putting community at the forefront of whatever work's being done, uh, whether it's research of community or it's just getting uh, narratives, oral traditions, uh, really letting community dictate and guide the direction that things are heading. Thank you. Beth? So I, I think about this in terms of, um, of land back and, and you know people hear land back and I know some hear it in different ways, right? Like some people hear it and they're like, oh no, they're gonna take all of our land and we're gonna be kicked off. Like that's extreme version, right? And then, you know, there's others that are, you know, that there's just different levels to it. And so when I think about the future and my hope for the future, I think of land back as maybe it is land back, right? Like maybe there is, are a acres and, and waters that are under our control. That would be amazing. Um, and yet it could also mean really restoring our um, collective understanding of who is who this land belongs to and, and who we share it with and what those stories mean. Uh, Queen Quetta, I'm also a historian. And so it's like, we, we have to educate people in 400 years of history and on the Mid-Atlantic East Coast, y'all, we got to talk about tribal relationships with the crown. And then we got to talk about travel and indigenous and, and you know all the African American all the connections with the U.S. government and those are two very distinct things. And now we and then we also have to talk about you know Jim Crow and we have to talk about Walter Plucker and we have to talk about all of these hugely complex things that are not taught in history books, right? Like y'all know that. And so in order for us to even get to meaningful conversation, we have to go back and fetch all of those stories and really put them in people's context. It's not enough to put in whose land am I on and come up with the name. Because if you don't understand how that name got there, it could be that folks started as Croatan, Tuscarora, et cetera, in this region, but now are called Halwa, Saponi, Lumbee, et cetera. Like if you don't understand any of those nuances, then you're not gonna be able to get to that point of what we're hoping to get to with this, this equity and this actual working together for resources. And so land back is story back is history back. I mean, that's really, to me, such a huge part of this. And until we get to that space, and then we're in this, in this truly community-minded approach that Jordan is describing, you know, we have to come with all of that in order to be in that community first space, but you really have to have the willingness and the time and the patience and, and please, you know, please don't think in terms of grant deliverables and grant project timelines because they are just really problematic and that it's really gonna have to take all of this time. But once we in invest in all of that, then we are gonna have this um, equitable future that I know that we are imagining, but you know, we, we have to do a lot of work to get there. And, and I think ha having these conversations and being really forefront and honest is how we're gonna get there. 
Excellent. Beth, I'm in the Hallelujah Choir. When you talk about <laughs> folks knowing their history as a public historian, unfortunately, let me apologize to everybody. We've got three more people to chime in on this statement, and you only have about 45 seconds each. My apologies. Please accept it. Coral, we're going to start with you, and then Queen Quet and Kayla. How about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, the, the things that inspire me, many have already been said, but the fact that our communities are always working towards sovereignty, ability to, to make our own decisions. We're growing those cultural stewardship practices. We're fo focusing on cultural revitalization because even the things that were lost, as many would say, aren't truly lost. It's always there. It's always there somewhere. Revitalization with, with language, with our traditional ecological knowledge, all of these things are really inspiring to see come back and um, grow within our communities. Also efforts towards land back um, and decolonizing management as one as much as one can decolonize, at least from um, inside state and federal institutions, maybe rather um, re-indigenizing that management and really focusing on indigenous and black um, academics and excellence and intelligence and the many different forms that that it comes in. Um, yeah, move, move on to the next person. Thank yes, you so Queen. much. Thank yeah. you, Cora. Queen, quite about 30 to 45 seconds. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, the Gullah Geechee Nation stood on our human right to self-determination so people would come to us. The Yeti from we who we be. Always go to the people, not the government agency. Do not go to the academic book and Google is definitely not God. Come to the people and Yeti from them who we be and you'll be learning how to carry on the legacy. Oh, wonderful final thoughts, Queen Quet and Kayla, please, your final thoughts on this and um, how you might like folks to work also with you. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, orgs and a lot of nonprofits really just need to like stand back a little bit. I'm saying this as someone who works in a nonprofit to stand back and realize that folks on the ground are asking for very extreme demands because we are facing like the end of the world and some folks are already living in that space. Um, I think that they also need to acknowledge that a lot of us are already building resiliency and, and surviving the cracks um, of the Imperial core, like finding community um, where we're able to find that. Um, and getting back to um, the lessons from our elders and our ancestors um, and really leaning into like joy as a power tool, joy as a way to be really creative and experimental in our fights um, and also building, you know, the strength to directly confront um, the imperial core that we're living in that is incredibly violent and will respond with violence to our joy and to our love for each other. Um, so I think that if orgs um, are willing to align with that and listening to Black and Indigenous queer women especially, um, then I think it'll be a really easy partnership um, and it'll be like an incredibly just like strong um, relationship as we're as we're moving like throughout this little space that we live in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kayla, for your final thoughts. And 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 again, we all just want to go ahead and give one last final thanks to all of our panelists. So thank you to Queen Quet. We're we're glad that you were able to, to stay on with us <laughs> for thank the you. time that you did. So thank you. Um, we'd yeah, also like to thank Kayla you. Braithwaite, uh, Jordan Revels, Beth Roach, and Coral Avery for joining us today. Um, when we thank you all for the tremendous work that you all are doing. So now I will turn it over to my colleagues, Courtney and Stephanie, to close out this event. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. We're so grateful to our panelists and EPA Administrator Regan for his opening remarks. We will continue these conversations as we further our climate crisis work in the Global Change Fellows Program. We know the relationships we form with communities, especially underrepresented communities, are paramount if we are to develop effective and usable solutions together. We want to thank you all for joining us. And a special thanks to Aranza Sue Lasserain, Carrie Furness, and Ashlyn Shore for their guidance and support in the CCASC office. If you would like more information about CCASC and the Global Change Fellowship Program, please visit us at ccasc.ncsu.edu. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.